Alderman Roy Wesley. Alderman Coles. Here. Alderman Shockey. Here. Alderman Sismarski. Here. Alderman Eugene Wesley. Here. Alderman Winger. Alderman Lazara. Here. Alderman Woods. Here. Okay, we'll say there's a quorum. Um, approval of minutes, April 26, 2012. That is my motion, approve the minutes. I'll Se second it. I have a second. Questions, concerns, changes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. And number, uh, item number three, report and recommendation, uh, san sanitation sewer evaluation survey review. Uh, Mr. Kramer, you want to take us through this? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before you, you have items four, five, and six. They're all interrelated, and I will uh, go through them. With me tonight is Mike Young with RJN. Uh, as you remember, over the last two years, we've completed a flow monitoring study in the city, and the first year one of our sanitary sewer evaluation study. And basically, um, in the first item, I just called out a quick review of the items that we found from last year's survey. Item six is the actual uh, design contract for the rehabilitation identified in that. And item five is next year's or starting this past May, this past Monday's May 1 sanitary sewer evaluation ongoing for the next section of town. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mike for a little bit of the review from last year's study and I'm gonna hand out some additional materials as well. Okay, yeah, I just I just brought a couple handouts that that uh, John's gonna pass out here. They're they're from the packet they sent, but are basically just gonna talk pretty much from from those two items. As you might you might remember when we were talking in the past, we started with flow monitoring a couple years ago, and then moved on to the sanitary sewer survey last year. Um, in the the area basically focused more in the southern south central part of the city. Uh, you might remember after the flow and one of the things I said was actually a very good thing for the city was that we found that um, although there was some excess flow that does need to be addressed and removed, the sewer capacity within the system was very good. I mean, there were some limitations at the plant, but within the sewers themselves, it was in, it was in good shape, and we were not recommending any kind of relief sewer. And you have a lot of your neighbors around you that don't have that situation, that are needing to remove I&I &I and still bid, build bigger sewers, too. And so it's, it's actually a very good thing. And there actually was some good news this year as well. Um, if you look at the pie chart that I passed out, basically what that is was, was the sources that we found from last year. And the, the, the ones that are shaded, the, the reddish tones, those are the public sector. That's the city system, the sewers and the manholes, everything that the city owns. And then the bluish colors are private sources, things from within the home or the laterals connecting the home to the city system. So you can see those, you can see kind of the mix there of the sources. Uh, many of the public sources can generally be fixed. You can fix the sewers and the manholes. And then on the private side, um, there's a wide variety of sources. And some of them, like the storm sumps and the diverter valves that you see on like the top part of that chart are, are relatively easy to fix. I mean, the cost of that, basically, you, you, instead of the storm sump taking the clear water pumped directly in the sanitary sewer, which is that case, you just have to, you have to repipe it and pipe it outside. So it no longer goes into the sanitary, it's piped outside. And so it's more of a piping change. Similar ones on the bottom, like the area drains, foundation drains are extremely expensive. You're talking, you know, three, four, five, even $10,000 to fix. And the good news is there's enough other sources, we don't need to touch those. And again, you have a lot of communities around you that don't have that situation or have, that have a lot of those foundation drains that are having to, to address it. So um, it's certainly some good news we found. There's still some things obviously we need to do. Um, first focused on the public sector side. So what we did, we finished that evaluation and as John mentioned, moving forward this year with basically fixing the system, rehabilitating your sewers. So that's where, that, that's, where that's going. So it's, it's Fixing the sewers where we might have some point repairs or maybe line the sewers. And then on the manholes, fixing those as well, whether it's just fixing the frame itself or actually doing some structural fixes to the sewer. So the plan is for that to be designed this year, go out to bid, have contractor to come in and fix that and move forward. Now on the private side, it's kind of following a, a separate track. 
Um, we did uh, building inspections last year. We got in a little over 60% of the homes we were trying to get in, which was a little bit lower than we really wanted to get into. Um, and the plan is with that, with the information we got down here, is to follow up with enforcement on these, these storm sumps and, and they saw the diverter valves in there. What that is, basically, when your sump pump comes out, in some cases, there's, the pipe goes in two directions and there's a valve on there. So we need to be pumped outside or pumped to the sanitary sewer. And so what we want to do there is remove that ability to pump to the sanitary <coughs> sewer and just have it so it always goes outside. So those are the two things that we were looking at addressing. Now, obviously, moving forward um, and following this through the building department was actually dealing with this, obviously, you want to try to get into as many homes as possible. You don't want a neighbor saying, hey, I cooperated and I got to fix my stuff. My neighbor didn't cooperate, now they don't have to do anything. So we are work, going to work with city staff this year and do some follow-up building inspections, send another letter out in the same area, try to get into the homes we didn't get into last year. So we're going to work with, with city staff to, to follow up with a little bit further with that. Um, as far as the residents being um, required to fix things at this level, that's pretty standard. Um, Anywhere in Cook County that's to MWRD, they were required to do that 20 years ago. Every, they did building inspections everywhere and the residents had to fix it. And this, this was standard things to address. Most uh, DuPage County communities have also done it as well. So th you're not doing anything unusual. It's pretty standard procedures for, for doing this kind of thing. As we said, since we don't have to get all of the flow out of the system, just, just a, a good portion of it, we can leave the very expensive stuff alone. Let's not even deal with it. It's not worth it. Most communities that have had to deal with it oftentimes either cost share or even pay for all of it, because they're like, we can't expect our residents to pay $5,000 to do this. If they'd pay three or $400 to do some piping, you know, it's a reasonable expense, but, but to do it more, it's, it's not realistic. But the good thing at this point in time from this area, we don't need to touch that. So then what we'll be doing this year, again, we'll be following up. Um, there's really two parts, in, in addition to um, to try to get into the, the homes that we didn't get into last year, we'll be working with city staff to, to die test the ones that we did find, these storm sumps and diverter valves. And what that does is you put dye into the pump and, and verify that it's going to the sanitary sewer, just a confirmation um, to make sure it's there before it actually goes to probably to the building department for follow-up um, from there. So it's just confirmation so there's, there's no question of whether there's something that needs to be fixed, that there's a, there's a connection that's not supposed to be in the sanitary sewer. You want the questions at the end or? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much done, so go ahead. Okay, my question is how many, how many illegal hookups did we find out there? We found, um, I think there was six, but I think there's 61 follow-ups that we have to do between the storm sumps and the diverter valves. So we had 61 illegal hookups. Right, out of, out of the 160 or so that we, that we inspected, so it's quite a few. Quite a few. Yeah. My question to, I guess this could be a discussion later down the line here. How are we going to address these illegal hookups if they don't obey by disconnecting and um, actions that we may take on these people? I mean, let, let's face it, we found them now. And are we waiting a year to go back and look at these? According to you next year, we don't look going back into them. But if we already know them already, we should react right now to these only your hookup and not let go. Mr. Kramer. Thank you. Um, yes, we did have some illegal connections we identified. We identified some, ones, some of the ones previous back in our Ward 2 study as well. Now that we've completed our first study, um, we're going to go back and work with the building department we did make some field recommendations when the inspections were originally made to residents letting them know that there were some deficiencies again the goal or the intent here is not to go in and say you must fix this within two days and at whatever expense it is we're going to be meeting with john from the building department we're going to work with his staff and our wastewater staff we're going to identify some of the deficiencies. We're gonna sit down ourselves, put some internal timetables together that we think are workable. Some of these issues will work through RJN because they'll be very specific. Others will be items that are simply just in the plumbing code and will need to be corrected. And again, those items will be dealt with through the building department because we already have those measures in place to make those inspections and ultimately to make those corrections. 
So really it's not as insurmountable as it may seem. It's just gonna provide to be notifications and then workable timetables to get those corrected. And anyone else have any questions on that? Or? I, I, I'm gonna turn it back over to Mike just so we can finish this okay, presentation. I, then I'm gonna take it back over and kind of lead us through. Yeah, yeah a, cu a couple of things I just wanna make sure you were clear on. When we do find some of these, some of them we know we can tell that it's connected to the sanitary and we're very confident that it is connected. Some of them, it goes outside and we're not, with their suspect and we're not sure. So when we do the dye testing, because some of them we might find, we think they are there, they might be, and then we dye test, you know what, they're not. And then we, you know, we want to make sure we don't follow up on people to fix things that they're not. We want to confirm and make sure that it is something that, that needs to be addressed. So that's one of the reasons, the dye testing. But the plan is to do that right away and move it right into that so we can start because so far we haven't fixed anything yet. We've only studied things. It's time to start fixing things and getting the flow out. So on the public side, moving right into design this year, fix stuff this year in this area. It's the plan is to get that out quickly um, and, then, and then get the ball rolling so some of these, these private sources can be fixed. And the map I gave you just showed that um, the part in the middle there, year one, you know, it's the additional building inspections, try to get where we weren't, the dye testing follow-up, and then rehab of the public system. And then the red areas on the two sides, that's the next year. That's the, the we're going to do the same study in that area that we did last year. Do you have a dollar amount what it would cost to fix our problems on our end? Yes. And, and that, that number was about three, six, our estimate was about 370,000. It kind of fits within the budget roughly was about 400,000. And there is um, some of those things when we get bids, we think the number will be a little bit less, you know, we're a little conservative with that, but it'll be right around the number that was budgeted. I, I, I have one follow-up question to our engineer. And let's, John, go ahead. Um, just if you see on page three of your packet, it has the executive summary, the recommendations and costs are all laid out there. They're broken out for each individual. So we anticipate the engineer's opinion of probable costs is that 371 figure. We had a budget amount of 400,000 for repairs, considering that we have about 30,000 in engineering, we fall within that. Now, again, if we go over that, we could tailor it back, but we'll come back to you once we have those um, prices from the contractors back and we can either tailor back the program or we can expend a little more and finish it up either way. Well, let me hand it over to Al. Yeah, I, I have one question on our engineer. Um, this is the INI study that we're doing right now, correct? My question is to you, Al, did you contact down in Springfield and get any information on uh, money that may be available for this project overall? Because there was money available when we met with the EPA. Have you did any follow up on that? We followed up uh, probably about a month and a half ago. At that point, they didn't have any information or additional information. At that time, um, we're hoping that within the next month or so, maybe we'll, we'll hear a little bit more. But I did not hear uh, at, at, when we contacted them about a month and a half ago. We did not hear hear anything. So I would continue to contact the EPA because there may be funding available to help offset the cost of, of the whole project of repair, doing our repairs that we have to do. So I would let staff know that we stay on top of that if there is money available out there for grant money. And we did file, oh, go ahead. And we did um, submit for the low interest loan as well. So um, yeah, we're, we're actively trying to pursue any funding sources that we can find. Anyone else have any questions? Mr. Woods? Yeah, I want to go back to the numbers. There was 279 homes identified. We actually inspected 155 homes. And of that, uh, we only got into 56% or it was 56% that were deficient. We got in. We got into 56 percent. That's what we got into, which is which is lower than we were really hoping to get into. I mean, it's an, it's a number, and that's one of the reasons John and I have been talking about okay for PR purposes and how do we get better participation. I mean, going into going into the follow. -up. And um, of that 56 percent, 30 percent of those of of the had illegal hookups. Of the 56 percent, it was it was it was close to it was about 35 percent or so that had 
that had potentially have some means. Again, we have to confirm. Some of them may not, we may find out they're not. But, but about, about a third of them had something that needs some follow-up. But if we use that number and the rest of your number, uh, those people that are, let's say, suspect or have deficiencies in those hookups is probably approaching 65% of the homes, if I read these numbers correctly. Mm -hmm. I would say, well, I think, I think what we're doing on, on the table one, that was just the ones that we didn't get into. So I, I, yes, but, it's, but I agree that assuming that you get that many more, it's probably closer to 100 homes or so that would have some issues that we would find. That's what we're kind of expecting out of the, out of the uh, 279. And then this, this question is to Mr. Kramer. Uh, do you have any idea? Obviously, it's nice that we're doing this. This is part of this is for the treatment plant and, and for our benefit, to reduce costs, all that. But we have done the studies in the past and, and nothing's really happened. I know that we've put money in the budget to take care of this, but we can spend 370,000 plus 30,000 in design engineering to do our part. But if the biggest part is on the private property owners section sector, uh, are we prepared to do what we need to do or, or continue to uh, pursue getting those items fixed? I guess is my question. As far as public works concerned, we will make the notifications and we will follow up until we have all the homes inspected, working with the building department to do that. As far as the enforcement arm, the enforcement arm is still the building department and their process for posting a home and saying that this needs to be completed in a certain amount of time. So the enforcement arm would ultimately fall upon the building department, but as far as public works is concerned, we are not going to let this um, continue. We are going to make sure we gain access and we make informed choices. Um, obviously, you know, the recommendations that both RJN city staff finds during those inspections will be working through the building department to aid us in making those notifications to the building owners, but then beyond that, the enforcement end of it then would fall upon the building department. Okay, the building department just left the building. Um, so uh, maybe the city manager can uh, field this question. Uh, again, it's the same thing. My question is, are we con going to continue to pursue this to get it uh, fixed? And that's not to say go in like Gestapo's and uh, demand people do, as I think the engineer said, five, six thousand dollars worth of work, but work with them uh, in an effort to work through this issue, which is an expensive issue to the treatment plant. I would say 100% we're absolutely committed on a staff level. Um, this is a continuing process. Every year you're going to see money pumped into this. We want to make sure that we're getting compliance from everybody or else we're wasting our own money. We want to make sure that this is really focused on and, and followed through with. Thank you. But I, I'll do a follow-up on that. So are we going to have a policy on how the building department is going to handle the situation? Or, or, or what are we going to do, or just, are you get, is staff going to make the decision? How are they going to handle it? Involve in legal or whatever we may have involved in this? I mean, Mr. Kramer. In talking to the city attorney, we already have the ability to make inspections and verify that those codes are being followed. And obviously, by way of the city code, we have the ability to make those enforcement rules in that. So we already have those guidelines set up. Again, it's just providing notification and putting timetables on that. And, and, and as I said, we'll be working with the building department to identify what those are going to be. And we want to make sure it's fair and equitable to everybody. But as a follow up to Art Woods, I know where he's going with this. That's fine. But what is a timeline? after you work with the building department on how many days are we going to give them to correct it how many days because uh, kind of with art i know where he's coming from are we going to throw it to a money pit that, that we're doing a study that we aren't going timeline or 
are we just going to say, okay, we visit them, they'll correct it, we don't go back in 10 a year, they fine. Is in that policy that we have, which John just walked in the building again, in that policy is it states in that policy we enforce, but I don't think that relies on how much timeline that they have to complete the problem that they have occurred to our city. Uh, Mr. Kramer, if you want to take it, take it. As I said, we will be working with the building department on those items specifically, and we will set up a schedule if there one does not already exist. Again, you know, we have problems on our own city infrastructure, and there's obviously in problems within the private side. We want to work on both. We don't want to just go after the residents and say, hey, look, you need to fix your deficient items that we've come to find out. We want to work on our, our items, and as we're doing that, we're going to be working on the private side as well. So again, we're going to work with the building department in defining that, and we will come back to you with those timetables if they need to be set up. Maybe they're specific. And again, some of the corrections could be as simple as removing a sump pump connection from going to the sanitary stack. Some may be a little bit more involved. And again, just to be able to come to you and say, it's three months drop dead date from the time inspection until the time needs to be corrected. I don't think I'm comfortable or I wouldn't want to put the building department on the spot tonight with something like that. So we're going to come back to you with those. Mr. Woods. Yeah, to, uh, I don't think, or at least I'm, my side, I'm not looking for you to tell me that it's going to be done in three months or six months or a year, just that we're actively going to pursue this and, and not in an adversarial way either. If, if the homeowner needs some help or they need some direction or some time, I think we should do it. It's just that everybody needs to understand what the cost impact of that, of those issues are. And when you look at the, the, the nice pie chart, my numbers say 60% of it the infiltration uh, is coming from residential, private party, whatever nice name we want to call it, and the other 40% is <laughs> the city side. And I get that we're working on both ends. I just don't want to throw good money after, or bad money after good money, good money after bad money, however that goes. Thank you. I believe a good summary from a staff perspective is we want compliance. It's about compliance, not punishment. So we're focusing on compliance. And I agree 100%, but again, timely he compliance. said he don't want us to throw money after money after money, and I agree with him. Oh, Mr. Uh, Force. Again, just to kind of reiterate, it currently is against the Wooddale Code to have any stormwater hooked up to a sanitary sewer connection. So anybody found is in violation. I agree we need to give people time an adequate amount of time to comply because it's what might work well to correct one situation will not work well to create another situation. We don't want people to disconnect their sump pumps from the sanitary line and then all of a sudden start flooding out their neighbor every time it drizzles a little bit. But there will be a definite timeline given if people do not comply to that. Again, we already have uh, you know, the requirements in the code. So what would happen ultimately, if somebody refuses to comply, they will be issued a citation up to $750 a day. If they don't pay that citation, we will then take them to court automatically. So the enforcement guidelines are in place already. It's just we have to figure out a reasonable timeline for people to comply. OK. Any other? Mr. Coles? That means that if a guy has a sub pump check and it isn't right, he's supposed to fix it. And you got, you, he fixes it, a month or two later, three months later, he hooks it back up again, which no inspector's been around, and it's back the same way as it was. Now, how can you prevent that from happening? You can't. You can't prevent that from happening because nobody gets in the house every three or four months to see what happened. The neighbor squeals on him, and the next thing you know, he's mad at the neighbor. Or somebody says, where's your sump pump going? Uh, you ain't hooked up. And it isn't that they don't hook them up, it's they don't want to hook them up. They'd rather have it, it's, it's easier to put a pipe in the sewer than it is to put it outside and 
put it all the way to the storm sewer, storm pipe that you have, uh, or the storm drain that you have in the ground. It costs too much money. But uh, <clears throat> how are you going to prevent that from happening after it's been inspected, after it's got the stamp on it? I got one with a stamp on it that you guys check. And uh, the guy next door has one stamped on it. Uh, but I'm, I'm just saying that how are you going to catch these guys that, that rehook it back up again after you leave a month or a month and a half to go? So how are you going to do that? A very valid point. Um, I can honestly say that, you know, if someone is maliciously trying to pump their sump pump, their water from around their home gutters into the sanitary system and they're handy and they have the ability to do that, our inspection, they're probably going to know what we're looking for. They're going to make the corrections. They're going to, when we inspect it, it's going to be accurate and within code, if they go back and change it, there's no way we're gonna be able to catch no, that. No way and that's not really the intent of what we're trying to do. We're really just trying to educate the homeowners that are out there that may not have bought a home, may not know that it's not hooked correctly. By no means is this a revenue generator for us. Any fines that are done, the intent is not to fine anybody. The intent is ultimately to save the city money on not treating this storm water, water that does yes, not need to be treated that. through our sanitary system I realize does not that, need to be pumped that way. So that's the intent. We're not looking at making this, as the city manager said, a punishment or in some ways a revenue generator. This is solely compliance so we but can have a tight sanitary system that functions for all residents, no excursions, and basically something that works. But you, you, you know that that's going to happen. You know that. I would like to think that, that, that everyone is honest and that is not the intent of anyone to maliciously add more undue stress to the sanitary system. Never happened. Okay, Mike. It's Mike. Mr. Kramer, is, is, there, is there nothing out there that is, seems, uh, is there an easier way, like a flow rating or a flow instrument to find out how much is coming through the sewer system on an everyday basis or? or after a rainfall? Mr. Kramer. Yeah, if, if you recall, the first year of this study, we did a flow monitoring study of the entire city. So we know in a heavy rainstorm what's coming through the sanitary system during a rainstorm, during average flow. But again, there's no way of figuring out how many times somebody flushes their toilet or uses their sink or takes a bath takes a shower, uses their dishwasher, and then equate that to, you know, I, can we use our crystal ball to see is that house out there, are they over their allotment? If that's kind of your question, I, it, which I think it kind of is, you're trying to know is there any way besides inspecting it, right. can we tell? Well, unfortunately, we don't have access to individual point connections at each, at, at each house. Sure, you could during a rainstorm if you had the ability to view each individual house connection, no looking at that, wow, there's water coming in from that individual service line the entire time it's raining. That's going to give you a good gauge that they're probably not standing there holding their uh, plunger on their toilet and you know just flushing water down. There's probably something hooked up a miss there. But again, we don't have that ability. But that's kind of how we prioritize this study. We use that flow monitoring data to look at where are the worst areas around town that offered us that. So hopefully that is kind of an answer to your question, a larger picture yeah. gauge that we used on that. Thank you. Mayor, please. John, <clears throat> I understand, you know, less water going through the treatment plant, less we have to treat. But I think in a conversation we had once, don't we also need to tighten up our lines because the IEPA only allows you so much extra flow into the treatment plant during rain events, if I remember that correctly. Otherwise, we get a slap on the wrist in the city. I, I believe we're say. doing that right now. Is that Never. true? <laughs> Sure, there are some numbers at the treatment plant that equate to what is it during your peak flow when you have, you know, excess flow conditions. Mm -hmm. Grand excess flow conditions are when it's it's raining out. You, you can treat that 
amount of excess flow differently. When your plant's in that excess flow category when it's raining, you have different parameters for treating that water than you do on your daily average where it's a, not a rainstorm, you're just treating the effluent coming in through a normal day. So there are some different parameters, but yes, you're absolutely right. We do have some limits that we have to meet. If we consistently go over those limits, there are some ramifications for that, yes. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Mr. Art Woods, I, I just wanted to uh, address Alderman Cole's concern. I think that that is an issue, but I think that the program, the way we set it up, uh, will address that. There's always going to be that person that's going to break the law, not follow the rules, speed, whatever it is. But I think in, in this, if we're, we're very proactive, I think that we can get the majority of the people. Uh, I think John said it, that a lot of people have, uh, bought houses here have just moved here are not aware that they're hooked up illegally. So uh, All in all, I think we're going in the right direction. I just want to Keep everything going that way. Thank you okay. And Is that it for your presentation? Okay. Any other questions? Okay Jen Mr. Kramer, go ahead, take us through the other. As I said, item four really is not an action item. I was just wrapping up last year's survey. I wanted to put it in your hands so you had a copy of it. That requires no action. It's already complete unless there was any additional information that you did not find in the report that you wanted in there. A recommendation would be that, that John, we would like this, and I would have Mike include that, whatever it may be. Number Item number five is actually next year's contract for that $107,000 figure, and then we can move on to the next one when you're ready. Again, I just wanted to clarify, there really is no action for the first item. Again, it's just the first draft report. All right, so we need no action on that one. Any action on number five, though? Report and recommendation. Contract row, contract award for 2012-2013 sanitation sewer evaluation survey, year two of RJN, not to exceed $107,840. Okay, and zero cents. That is my motion to approve a contract. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I didn't hear a word down there at all. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. None, none in favor? Motion carries. Report and recommendation contract award, uh, sanitation sewer for manhole rehab, engineer designed to RJN group not to exceed $29,935. That is my motion. Second. Questions, concerns? Mr. Art Woods. Thank you. Uh, my question on the, the design fee, a lot of these things seem to be maintenance issues, you know, uh, reworking manholes, resealing things seem pretty mundane. I mean, is that really something that needs to be designed? I'm going to hand that question over to Mike. It's it's a mixture of items. Um, some of them are very simple. Some of them pretty much come right out of our report. You know, when we're doing lining, we got a map. You don't really need to do a whole lot more than that. Some of them we've got what are called point repairs, um, which means there's there's issues with the sewer. We can't just line it. We actually have to dig down and replace that section of the sewer. Whenever you're digging, you really need to do a set of point. You need to actually do a survey. You got other utilities and other things in there, so that. There is a little mini design on each one of those and um, that's done. And then part of it is just putting a package together. It's got to go out to bid. So there's got to be a bid package that goes to contractors, then they go. So some of it is just the paperwork involved with, with doing that. So you guys are handling all the paperwork, the bidding process, and that for that dollar amount? Right. OK, thank you. Mr. Kramer. And just one follow up. Traditionally, we have standard details in the city that list what a, a, a sanitary sewer structure looks like. Again, when these point repairs are done, and as Mike alluded to, each of those structures may not have been built. They may be a block structure where they're literal brick and block mortar structures. Each of those is a little different, and repairing those versus replacing them is 
far less expensive and we would much rather repair them, make them watertight than to actually rip it out and have to either remove a structure in the road or cause even more undue um, construction due to actually replacing it. So that's kind of the need for the design. Sure, we could go out, we did a design back in 2009 where we just did some slip lining. And again, that's relatively cut and dry. You give them the, uh, the linear feet, you call out what you want your restoration to be, and that's fairly cut and dry. These point repairs are the ones that are actually, as Mike alluded to, a mini design on that actual structure. Any other questions? I have a motion, I have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item number seven, report of recommendation contract award 2012-2013 street improvement program to Pulpy, Pulpy Construction not to exceed $1,678,389 and a penny. Make that motion. That is my motion. Second. Questions, concerns? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item number eight, report and recommendation contract word that, uh, booster pump station four and five. One replacement to an ind independent mechanical and industrial not concede $189,940. That is my motion for the pump. Uh, booster stations. Second. Questions? Concerns? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Question down. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Coles. Are these going to be new pumps, John? Oh, yeah, Mr. Uh, Kramer? Absolutely brand new. That We will not be rebuilding the existing pumps. The ones that are currently there are in this in anywhere between the 60s and the 70s depending on the age there's two different um, um, water facilities that they're going into so yes they will be new new pumps i'm sorry mr Coles. so i have a motion i have a second all in favor aye aye, aye. opposed <laughs> motion carries i didn't consider a future meeting i would like a update on how we going uh handle the uh, illegal hookup if we could have that uh Policy represented to us that is in place where we can look at it. Absolutely, I, I won't have a meeting date for you. Let me confer oh, with that's uh, fine. John Forrest, and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Uh, any other items in future meetings? Okay, I'll obtain a motion to adjourn. Second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. I'm calling to order the uh, Planning, Zoning, and Building Committee of May 10, 2012. Will the minute taker please reflect? Um, um, all members are present except for Alderman Ray Wesley, so I do declare a quorum. Uh, next item is approval of minutes dated April 26, 2012. I do make that motion. Is there a second? Second. Anything on the question? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next item is um, item number four, report and recommendation on the local building code amendment. So I believe we're about to pick up somewhat where we left off and work on some more of the amendments. And with that, I will let uh, Mr. Forrest take us through where he wants us to start out. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, it's my understanding uh, that Articles 10, 11, 12, and 13 were mistakenly left out of the packet, but you were supplied copies of that uh, earlier. I apologize for that. Uh, tonight, we're going to try something new. Since we're in the 21st century, we're going to use this thing, although I do know it's an iPad. And we're going to, under the suggestion of the city manager, we're going to present as a PowerPoint. We're going to touch on basically the highlights of the remaining chapters of the code and what the changes are. Two weeks ago, we spent about an hour and a half I promise we will not go any longer than that tonight as well. So unless you have any questions, we'll start right away. Article 10, fire prevention. The main changes uh, that we're making to the code, and uh, these are items that we have worked with the fire district on. Uh, we've reviewed these several times. And basically what we're going to do is lower the minimum square footage to 5,000 square feet 
from the 12,000 square foot figure which is contained in the code as to when an automatic fire sprinkler system is required in certain residential occupancies, commercial and industrial occupancies. Several communities have just sort of waived this requirement. Certain communities have revised that 12,000 square foot figure down. We feel that 5,000 is a, is a realistic figure to require somebody building a new commercial or industrial building to have to put in a fire sprinkler system. Section F907, fire alarms and detections. Again, it lowers the threshold where the fire alarm detection system is required, uh, and we're basing it on a square footage number, whereas the code talks about you know, several stories above fire department access and so forth. This clarifies it just as if you're gonna build it above the certain square footage, you need to put in a detection and fire alarm system. Uh, page 46, chapter 61, let's see. This clarifies and provides for a specific location where uh, companies are gonna have to store LP tanks. We've got some stricter requirements where they can be stored on the exterior of the building. Let's see, which way are we going here? Can you expand on LP? LP is... I'm sorry, yeah, liquid propane. Okay, gotcha, okay. Compressed liquid propane tanks. Okay. They typically use for forklifts and so forth. <laughs> the code uh, does allow <laughs> indoor storage of that. Again, the fire district does not feel comfortable with that. I agree with them. Yeah. So for years, we've required it to be stored outside. We're going to continue with that practice. Okay. Alderman, you, Team Wesley? So my question to you, if there's a company already storing them in, inside, and I'm sure we have a few of them, are we going to go back to those businesses and tell them now that we change our code that they have to install them outside? Well, they Or are they going to be grandfathered in? Businesses are allowed to keep two tanks indoors for use with the fork, forklift trucks daily or every other day. Anything, any quantity larger than two tanks per unit has to be stored on the exterior of the building. And we've been enforcing that for quite some time. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Actually, that's what I was gonna ask. I thought they were allowed two tanks as long as they were chained up in a secure area with the pole and, okay, but sorry. No, that's correct. I will continue with that. Alderman Woods. Yeah, just clarification. The two tanks that you can store you said per unit, so if they have 10 forklifts, they'll have 10 tanks on the actual forklift and can store 20 tanks, is that correct? I've never seen a forklift that uses more than one tank, although the size of the tanks can vary. Uh, I mean, typically they use one tank. No, but didn't you say that they could, if they have a forklift, if I have one forklift, I can store two tanks inside? Correct for my forklift. Correct. So it would be three total with the one that's actually on the forklift. Correct. So now if I have 10 forklifts, that's 30 tanks in the building. Correct. So that would be acceptable. According to the code that we have, yes. Well, I, and, it, and it doesn't come into play a lot, but I, I'm asking because if, if you have concern and the fire department has concern, then obviously as that company gets bigger and the use of those forklifts uh, mm -hmm. is greater. Now we're back to creating a situation that both of you guys are concerned about. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should add it. You know, you can have two per unit up to five units, up to six, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. And if you're comfortable with 20, then leave it 20. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, let me talk to the fire district about that and get some feedback from them. And if we need to add, you know, a revision to this, we can certainly do that and represent it to you. Alderman Coles. Uh, to talk about having 10, 10 forklifts, all, gas, all of them don't run out of gas at the same time. So I would say uh, they probably might have four, and, but, but not 20 of them. Uh, that's kind of foolish because you can get the tanks in one day, in one day if you need them. Right, so, but the rule says that they can store two know, per unit. It doesn't matter when they run out. I don't think the company would go have sitting 20 tanks around. Okay, It'd be so, kind of dangerous. 
Okay, so I understand, Mr. Forbes, you're going to check into Correct. how to yes. word that, and then there will be an action item that we bring back. Yes. Okay, thank you. The next code section we addressed was uh, water distribution for fire hydrant spacing. And what we're doing in here, we're putting a maximum of 300 feet between fire hydrants. That will be consistent with the Unified Development Ordinance, which the requirement in there is also maximum spacing of 300 feet but we will require a revision to the subdivision chapter in the municipal code, which currently allows up to 375 feet between hydrants. But again, today 300 feet is pretty much the standard. So this will just make it uh, the building code consistent with the Unified Development Ordinance. I'll turn you to Wesley. So we're going to have two choices, 300 feet or 375 in the code? No, we'll be revising the municipal code section 11.307 D2 which currently allows 375 feet between the hydrants. So that's something we can, uh, we'll have to do at a future meeting, but that will, the maximum spacing of fire hydrants will be 300 feet, period. Alderman Woods. Thank you. Um, so this will be for all new subdivisions or streets that are put in or all streets that are reconstructed where this 300 number will come into play, is that correct? I would agree, yes. It's definitely with the new subdivisions, new construction, whether we have any areas where fire hydrants are spaced further than 300 feet apart right now. I really can't address that. Perhaps Mr. Kramer would know, but uh, <coughs> you know, if, if, if something is existing like that, we wouldn't necessarily make them go back and move a fire hydrant 75 feet because that would probably be on our nickel to do at this right, point. Right, but when we so. rebuild, a, do a reconstruction or Let's say if it's even resurfacing, what, what qualifies as when that, not, that code gets triggered to replace that hydrant? I'm going to jump in. Mr. Mm -hmm. Forrest, uh, Mr. Kramer wishes to be recognized. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. The last couple uh, water mains that we've replaced, our max is 300 feet now. So we don't go beyond that as it stands. Any water main replacement program or even just looking at some simple valve replacements, we've designed that to be the maximum distance. So currently we are compliant in our standard details and our engineering that we have been doing over the last several years. Okay. Next item. Okay, Alderman, you do you want to so if a building, to if a default building permit out to do modification on apartment building or something like that, we gonna require them to do it. Yes. Okay. And it's only if they share a common area, though, right? I mean, right. there could be attached homes. Uh, that there could be attached homes that don't have a common area. Therefore, there'd be no exit signs. Right? Correct. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right, the next section, Wait, Article try. 13. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I'm Mr. Sorry. Ferris, uh, Alderman Coles? Are there uh, no exit signs going to have the floodlights with them or no? Yes, they'd have to have emergency they have lighting. They have the floodlights with Correct. them. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And they do make units today that have both right there, so you're not going to have to run additional. Correct. Article 13, moving and demolition of buildings. On page 52. We're adding a requirement to establish vegetation where construction of a new building would begin at a later date. In other words, so we don't have a situation where a building is torn down and a lot just remains vacant and mud or dirt or gravel or those types of materials for extended periods of time. Page 53, we're further requiring grading and landscaping plans for a lot 
If you're going to leave a lot vacant and you're going to do some regrading and plant some vegetation, you will have to submit a grading and landscape plan for review and approval by staff and or the city engineer. Mr. Mayor. John, that one there, is that when somebody tears down a home or are you talking about somebody who has a vacant lot right now? Somebody tears down a home. This code section is for demolition and rebuilding. Okay. And again, what we want to uh, try and avoid is, is going through long periods of time, several years with lots of non-compliance. Next section, Article 14, swimming pools. Our original swimming pool ordinance was almost nine pages in the building code. That's because that was kind of put together before uh, we, the codes that are in existence now were actually created. So we basically had full specifications on how to build a swimming pool, what you had to do. So we've consolidated that nine pages down into one page. Go ahead. So that section, no added fee for spot tubs, Mr. Forrest. So, so that means if someone wants to have a hot tub in their backyard or yes. like an example like that, there's an extra fee on top of just a pool fee? Correct. Yeah, there was. Why is that? The, uh, our, our older code did not contain a section, did not address spas and hot tubs, that sort of thing. Okay. So even though by definition they could be considered a swimming pool, we just wanted to add those in. And is it because there's certain regulation on temperature or a concern? Why is that? Well, there's concern about how the electrical work is done and how, how, it's, what, how it's hooked up. Uh, you're also required to have a cover and or have a fence to protect the hot tub so that small children can't access gotcha. it. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Article 15, driveways and culverts. Uh, we did. We are recommending a change in here, uh, as far as no longer allowing gravel driveways once the value of an improvement to a piece of property would exceed 25 percent. Article 16, elevator code. Again, we've deleted a lot of material in there that was kind of obsolete. There were requirements that we had put in years ago. Uh, we're now deferring back to the state regulations as the state pretty much has control over the elevator program. We do use our own independent elevator inspectors, but they have to follow the state guidelines. Article 18, page 60, mobile home parks. We do want to add a section in there that any privately owned and operated public water system shall comply with the DuPage County Health Department and State of Illinois rules, regulations, and licensure requirements. There's a new section that is not included in our mobile home park section right now. We do have one mobile home park in town. I would not anticipate we'll get any new ones in the future, but uh, again, this is a section that we felt was important to put in there. Fences and dog runs uh, now requires, It's again, it specifies that a permit is required for a dog run. It was a little vague in the previous code, so we just that was a clarification we wanted to put in. Page 63, what we're... Uh, oh. Do you wish to be recognized? Yes. You do you Why would you have to pull a permit for a dog run? Come on. Because a dog run is required to be a certain distance from property lines. It has to be set back, whereas a fence can be right on the property line. So we basically have to look at it uh, for zoning compliance. Line. I mean, how big a dog run are we talking? I mean, I think we really push our luck on that one. I, I, I see the point that you'd want an adequate fencing to contain the dog. and. Some people might think a one-foot fence is enough, Mr. Mayor. What about the electric fences that a lot of people put in, John, around the around their property? Well, this really doesn't apply to an electric fence. 
uh, you know, again, this just, if, if you're putting up a fenced area specifically to keep your dog in, our current code requires that a dog run shall be, uh, may not be erected or maintained beyond the front building line or within five feet of a side property line. So, I mean, most people who have dogs, they've got their whole backyard is fenced. You are allowed to have your fence go up to your property line. If you are creating a kennel area, for example, for your dog, then it, it, currently it's got to be held back five feet from the property line. So let's say in my block that nobody has fences. Few of the neighbors have the electric fences, and I'll be honest, the neighbor's dog comes across the line. So what? I mean, are they going to have to put up a fence? or What, what are we saying here? I'm just not sure. Are you, are you telling them they're going to have to put up a fence? No. We're not saying that they have to put up a fence. If, if you've got the neighbor's dog is coming onto your property and you don't care to have them on there, I would recommend that you would call the police department at that no, point. I, but as far it as... It doesn't bother I, me I, I didn't mean you specifically. I'm saying, you know, any resident. But, I mean, right, uh, there's a lot of dogs and nobody has a fence. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got them on a leash or something. So, so to clarify, this is only if someone wishes to put up a physical fence to contain their dog, they have to do it within these new parameters, correct? Correct. correct. And again, these are not new parameters. These have been in the code for years. What we're doing is that uh, it was never really specified that if you're doing a dog run, you have to get a permit. And we're just, again, we're clarifying that section of the code and expanding on it. I mean, you are, if you're going to put up a fence, you have to come in and get a permit. Okay. The dog run section is contained in the fence section, but again, just for, some, for sake of clarification. Okay. Alderman Eugene Wesley. But if you put an electric fence in, the people, like he said, do you need a permit for that? I would think if you're going to, I mean, a lot of the electric fences are just <coughs> plug in. If you have something that just plugs into an existing outlet, typically you don't need a permit. If you're installing something that would require hardwiring and, you know, access into the electrical panel, then you would need an electrical But panel. is it in the code here? Is it in the code that they have to pull permit for electrical fence? That would be contained in the electrical code, yes. Again, typically plug-in appliances do not require permits. Mm -hmm. Once you install the lines, then you have to talk to the building department if it requires like hired electrical lines, right? Correct. Okay. Just like with anything. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Alderman Woods? Yeah, just to, maybe I can help clarify. Um, from other communities, I mean, this is a typical ordinance and, and to the mayor's area where people don't have fences, uh, somebody could move in, they could have a pit bull, a boxer, a German shepherd or something. They want to be safe. They want to create a dog run. They don't want to fence their whole yard, but they just want a, an area they can let the dog out and, and know that he's safe. And the reason they keep it uh, five feet is one that's in line with all the other uh, appurtenances that you'd have on the property sheds and stuff like that and two in a lot of areas people would build that dog run and they put it further away from the house and if there is no fence they kind of try to find the property line and, and they usually when they error they error three feet onto the other guy's yard when they set it up and it becomes a war so uh, just having this kind of keeps gives us some checks and balances on what goes on with the dog runs and where they're placed. All right. <clears throat> uh, the next section that we were uh, recommending we change, page 63, section 12, 1903E, fences around swimming pools. Uh, we're recommending that that be revised to four foot high fence as from the current five feet. Four feet is uh, consistent with most of the other neighboring municipalities. It's also consistent with what's currently required in the code. What we found in the past is a lot of times people will want to put an above ground swimming pool in and they might have a four foot chain link fence around their yard and we say, well, that's great. You can have the pool, but it's got to be segregated from everywhere else by a five foot high fence. Mm -hmm. Some people just can't afford that or then they end up putting a little five-foot fence just around the pool. So again, the national code, 
most of the neighboring communities allow a four foot fence, so this will just put it consistent with those requirements. Ms. Mr. Mayor. So I thought the, the height was so you don't have young kids zipping over and jumping into the pool. That's no longer, I mean, four feet, five feet an extra foot. I, I don't know, I, th I always thought the fence was to keep the little kids from getting into the pool area. Is it that big a deal? I, I don't know, maybe I'm. Forrest? Well, that is typically the purpose of having the fence is to keep basically small children uh, from it gaining access to the pool. You know, again, if, if you as a group decide you want to keep it at five feet, we can do that. We found in the past it's been that the five foot requirement's been problematic for a lot of people that want to put pools in their yard that have existing four foot chain link fences. Um, you know, this is just something to try and make it a little bit easier for some of the residents to put the pool in. Yeah. I'm going to suggest we concur with your recommendations unless I hear disagreement. Okay. Okay, next item. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, and basically for the rest of the code, uh, they're just very minor alterations that uh, you know, aren't really that much of a change from what's existing. So unless okay. you have any questions, okay. I'm finished. Any final questions other than that one item that you're going to check on?